Hi, my name is Morgan and I am a neuroscience researcher and today is the first Monday of February which means that today is a mental health Monday uh, video. If you're new to the channel, which most of you are because I've gotten a lot of new subscribers lately, on the first Monday of every month I make a video talking about different concepts in mental health from a neuroscientist perspective. So this Monday we're going to be talking about reading. I've been getting a lot of comments lately of people asking me to do a reading list for different neuroscience books that might be useful for beginners or people interested in neuroscience. And if you stick around to the end of this video, I will definitely be giving you one of those. But it made me start thinking about um, reading as a mental health concept. It, if there are any real benefits to reading versus watching videos versus listening to podcasts or things like that. So I want to begin this episode by saying that I did a lot of googling and a lot of searching for different uh, scholarly articles about reading and honestly it was really difficult for me to find real scientific papers in uh, reputable journals about how reading affects your brain or how it influences it. There is some research out there on how reading uh, fairly bilinguals affects your brains, but I really wanted to do this from a mental health perspective and not so much a like what is happening in your brain when you're reading. So all of the information that I'll be giving today is mostly coming from articles that I found online that um, I believe to be reputable, but of of course, take everything with a grain of salt. I will be linking in the description all of the articles that I used, as always. The first thing that I found in regards to reading and your mental health is that reading actually increases our empathy for others. Specifically, reading fiction stories and sort of inserting ourselves into other people's shoes really helps us to imagine what it's like to be another person, and therefore it helps our, our ability in everyday life to be able to relate to other people because we have this experience of putting ourselves in each other's shoes. It can also help with our ability to understand interpersonal interactions because often fiction stories are written from sort of a third Third person point of view or an omniscient point of view where you're able to understand the thoughts of multiple characters and see why they're interacting with each other in the ways that they are and that helps us in our everyday life be able to do the same. I also saw that reading books that are more bibliographical like autobiographies of people who have struggled with mental health issues or with whatever current issue that a person is facing can help people to sort of realize that these are shared common experiences and help uh, with the feeling of loneliness that often comes along with a lot of those issues. And building on that, if we see a character in fiction or nonfiction who has a similar mental health struggle to us, it could be useful to recommend that book to uh, family members or to friends or partners to help them understand what you're going through because oftentimes the author will be able to write that in a better way than we are able to express it ourselves and they'll be able to see what it is that we are going through. And lastly, with all of the fiction recommendations, um, reading fiction it can also give us a sense of escapism, which often those who are suffering from anxiety or depression or other disorders that make you feel um, really, really down in like your everyday life, you can pick up a fiction story and escape to a fantastical world, which is a method of coping and is a really useful method of coping in my opinion. Reading is also highly encouraged for people in older populations who are aging and who are sort of at risk of losing some brain function due to aging. So it's no secret that as we get older, our um, mental capacity, our ability to remember things and our ability to, to do certain things declines just, just due to age. That's just the way that things work. But also that your brain is similar to a muscle. Like if you don't use it, it's going to decline faster. Um, so reading is a way to use your brain every day in my opinion, in an entertaining way, in a way that uh, sort of gets you thinking a little bit extra. One study even found that people who read have a 32% decrease in their mental decline as they age, uh, meaning that they their mental decline was slower than those who did not read. Some surveys have showed that um, reading helps put our brain in sort of the similar state to meditation. It shows a lot of the same benefits of meditation. So uh, people who read often report having better sleep, lower stress, higher self-esteem, and lower rates of depression. But I think it's important to note that that was a survey and self-reported. So um, 
I always take those studies more with more than a grain of salt than uh, scientific studies, but that's the neuroscientist coming in more than the psychologist. <laughs> Lastly, I thought it was really interesting to find that there is a type of therapy called bibliotherapy, where either a therapist or a library guides you through a strict reading schedule. And these uh, schedules and these programs are often promoted to people struggling with mental illnesses. One study found that these uh, programs decrease depressive symptoms in uh, people who undergo the programs, but that was one study and there's a lot of extensive research that needs to be done before this is sort of validated as a form of therapy. So unfortunately, that was really all that I was able to find on reading as it relates to mental health. I would like to make a video in the future about just how our brain works whenever we're reading, but since this is Mental Health Monday, I thought I would just focus mostly on mental health. If you know of more resources where people can learn about this please link it in the uh, comments and I'll be sure to promote that wherever I can but on to some book recommendations because people have been asking for it specifically uh, Vincent and passerby thank you so much for asking for this in the comments it made me do a lot of asking people about books which I think is always a fun conversation to have so some of the books that I'm about to recommend are books that I have read and that I really enjoyed and some are ones that my friends and colleagues have recommended to me all of the books that I'm about to talk about are written on a level where the everyday person would be able to read it and understand it. So if you can watch my videos and understand the words that I'm saying, you'll be able to read these books and find them interesting, I promise. The first book is the only one that I have a physical copy of and it's called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. I think this is a really good one to recommend during a Mental Health Monday because it is all about mental health and about stress. The angle that this book takes is that um, the way that stress in a human works is somewhat different from the way that it works in an animal because your stress response is sort of based in your flight or fight response and the fight or fight or flight response is meant to shut down at some point because the concept of why zebras don't get ulcers is that they're not able to worry about things in the future so they're just worried about immediate dangers and immediate dangers go away the future never goes away the future is always there waiting for us so um that's why humans are able to get significantly more stressed out because we can imagine what's going to happen in the future. I think this is a really great book for people suffering from anxiety or depression or for people who are looking to understand those concepts better. It does give, uh, I think there's a whole chapter in coping with anxiety and I think I found the book really useful. Another one is called This Is Your Brain on Parasites, which I know is going to remind a lot of you of This Is Your Brain on Drugs. Don't think about that. <laughs> but This Is Your Brain on Parasites talks about different parasites that go into your brain. It talks about parasites in different animals as well as in humans and it does in fact touch on the parasite that is in cat litter that gets into your brain. I promise. It's very interesting. I like it a lot. Um, I highly recommend. Except I don't think it's a good book to read like if you're squeamish about parasites. I know I get very paranoid about them because you can't see them and you don't know when you have them. So um, heads up on that. I think it's fun to read books written by uh, neurosurgeons and neurologists also because I think it gives you a different perspective from a neuroscientist um, because while they do know a lot about the brain, they don't look at it, I think, in the same way that we do, but they do interact with it more often than we do because a lot of times neuroscientists are working with animal models and neurosurgeons and neurologists are working with humans, so I think it's a cool perspective to look at. So one of these books is called The Tale of Dueling Neurosurgeons, which is about different historical cases that neurosurgeons in the past slash physicians in the past before neurosurgery was a thing uh, encountered and how it's helped us learn about the brain. A similar one is called Do No Harm by Henry Marsh who is a neurosurgeon and he goes through different cases that he's encountered and how he has to deal with those and how he interacts with the brain as a neurosurgeon. If any of you have read Still Alice, which I think is one that a lot of people get recommended when they're looking for neuroscience books, um, there's the author who wrote Still Alice also wrote a book about um, left neglect called Left Neglected. And left neglect is a disorder where uh, typically occurring from some sort of traumatic brain injury, people then sort of don't process the left half of their body, or it also happens on the right side. So they don't process one half of their body uh, in cases like this, people who grow beards often won't shave that half of their body or people who wear makeup won't do makeup on that half of their body and they don't realize that they're doing it. Their brain just doesn't perceive that half of them. If they're drawing a picture, they won't draw the left half of the picture 
it's a really fascinating disorder and this author wrote it similar to still alice as uh, the case of a person going through this disorder but i believe it is fictional lastly i highly highly recommend the book what it's like to be a dog the title is a little bit misleading it doesn't focus on dogs as much as you would think that it does but it's about the neuroscience of different animal species species other than humans which i think is a really cool perspective because oftentimes we're looking at brains as they relate to humans. So while I study rat brains, I'm always thinking, how can I relate this back to a human brain? And this book goes into the way that different brains are different, which I think is really cool to just sort of look at them individually. So I hope you found that reading list useful. I hope you go check those books out. I will link to the Amazon page for all of them down below, but I also highly recommend checking out your local bookshop and seeing if they have any of these. I am all for supporting local businesses, so I'd recommend doing that. I'll also link all my sources in the description as per usual. And like I said, if you have any uh, sources on uh, how reading improves your memory or your mental health, please, please, please leave those down in the, in the comments. And lastly, if there are any mental health topics that you would like to see me cover, please feel free to comment them down below or email them to me at askaneuroresearcher at gmail.com. And you can also reach out to me on all my social medias, which I'll list here. And with that, thank you for watching this video and I'll see you next Wednesday. Bye.